Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start in New England. Marcellus, I was thinking about our Patriots conversation yesterday. All right. I came to the realization that you and many other football experts have Stockholm Syndrome. Oh, really? Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and the New England Patriots took the NFL hostage 20 years ago, and over the course of the past two decades, many football experts have fallen in love with their captor. As a long-suffering Chiefs fan, as someone who has never seen his favorite football team play in the Super Bowl, I do not love my captor. Hmm. I'm jealous of their success, and I want to be freed from their rulership of the NFL. I can see the Patriots for what they are, a decaying, vulnerable ruler ripe for overthrow. You can't see them objectively, Marcellus. Now, Mm. Bucky Brooks, on the other hand, he's the Nat Turner of football experts. Bucky has snapped. (laughs) It's over for the Patriots. It's over because their quarterback is the worst quarterback in the playoffs. Tom Brady is the weakest link. He is the worst quarterback in the playoffs. All right, Bucky went a tad too far yesterday. Josh Allen is the quarterback of the Bills. Brady is the 11th best of 12 quarterbacks in the postseason. The truth is, the Patriots are the 11th best team of the 12 in the postseason. Buffalo is the only team worse than New England. Of course, the four top seeds are better than New England. But give me Philadelphia, Minnesota, Houston, Seattle, New Orleans, and most important of all, give me Tennessee over the Patriots. You know what the Patriots are? The last eight games of the season, a 500 football team. Four and four. They're average, and they know it. They're the 11th best team with the 11th best quarterback. They're not winning on Saturday. There's no reason to be scared. Yesterday, people over Twitter were giving me grief for giving the Patriots bulletin board material with my countdown clock. The old Patriots used to eat doubt for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just last year, Brady and Chris Hogan celebrated beating my Chiefs in the AFC Championship by mocking their critics in their post-game celebration. Too old, I'm too old. Too old. You're too no. slow. We got no skill players. We got no defense. We got nothing. All right, this year it isn't about the Patriots being too old. It's about them not being good enough. Mm. It's about them being the 11th best. It's about Rob Gronkowski sticking to his retirement and Antonio Brown being stuck on stupid. This is how bad New England's offense is. The Patriots are 0-4 when their defense surrenders more than 17 points. Bulletin board material won't save the Patriots. Linebacker Kyle Vannoy called these playoffs a potential revenge tour for New England. Revenge? Who do the Patriots owe revenge? Does Vannoy think he plays for the Saints? Hmm. No, 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 no. We are owed revenge. Chiefs fans, Chargers fans, football fans. The clock is ticking on the end of this dynasty. I can't wait. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL analysts T.J. Huspenzada and Bucky Brooks. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Yeah. All right, which playoff statement is more true? Patriots are the 11th best team or Brady is the 11th best quarterback? Mm, since it's holiday time and I need this check to clear, I got to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, these are just two impossible choices right here. But I'm going to say that the Patriots are the 11th best team. But in reality, they are the fifth best team in these playoffs. And Tom Brady is the fourth best quarterback in these Wow. Players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real mm. talk. I don't know what happened to you mm. yesterday. <laughs> Bucky, what were you doing to give Hold on, I want this? you to explain both of them. Okay, all right. Let's be real. Playoff time is a different atmosphere, different mindset. I trust Drew Brees, Patrick Mahomes, and Lamar Jackson just because of how phenomenal he was this year to translate that into playoff success. I don't trust anybody more than Tom Brady, but I could put some people close to him. I could put a Russell Wilson close to him. I could put an Aaron Rodgers close to him. I could even say, you know what, the way that young Jimmy GQ has been looking of late, I could put him close to him, but no one surpasses him but those three. Let's talk about the teams. San Francisco, New Orleans, Baltimore, KC. Done. Who else do you think that you trust more 
than the New England Patriots in playoff mode. So that's why I say fourth best quarterback, fifth best team. But more than that, I think everyone is looking at the Patriots for the wrong reasons. Everyone's looking at the wrong thing. It's not their offense that has ever led this team to the Super Bowl championships. Let's be real. Tom Brady's won three regular season MVPs. How many Super Bowls he win in those years? Donut. Zero. This is a team that, when they had the best offense, went 0-4 in Super Bowl opportunities. But they went 2-4 when they had the best defense. And this defense this year is better than any of the defenses that they've ever paraded into the playoffs. I'm accurate. Nat Turner over here tripping, but I'm going to let him speak. <laughs> I'm not tripping. I, I just don't understand why Jason decided to hedge his bet when he said the 11th best quarterback. When it's clear and apparent, he is the worst quarterback in the playoffs. And I know you put the graphic up about Josh Allen and his passer rating at 85.3. That's why he's the worst. But Josh Allen scores touchdowns with his legs. Yeah. He has a different dimension that Tom Brady doesn't have. So when you're looking at the playoff field, and let's just take the name off the back of the jersey. If we just looked at number 12 for the team in blue, he's the worst quarterback in the playoffs. Mm. And if you would quit being scared of the boogeyman and just say it, <laughs> then you'll feel better. Because when you click on the TV on Saturday, he is the worst guy. Period. Like Hold this, on, is, this whole boogeyman thing, uh, like, look, that was a, a, a fixation of our imagination, right? Like, you never really saw the boogeyman. I played against Brady, bro. He for real. Yeah, that ain't no fake boogie man. 20 years ago. What do you mean? years ago. They won the Super Bowl last year. It hasn't even been a year yet. Okay, and you won know what? I'm going to make it easy for you. Tom Brady is Michael Jordan with the Wizards. If you're okay with that, then did, that's did, what did, he did, is. did Michael Jordan win with the Wizards? No. Well, then he ain't Michael Jordan with the Wizards. <laughs> well, Tom with the Brady Wizards. ain't won yet. Oh, he, he won, won last, last year. year. No, 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 no. He's talking about this year. Right now. He's talking Tom about right now. now. It's not he's a lifetime right achievement now. award. Tom Brady. Right now. Tom Brady threw more interceptions than touchdowns last Michael year. Michael Jordan averaged 20 with the Wizards. Thank you. Come on, now, y'all. I'm, it's the 11th best team. Brady is not the 11th best. Oh. I look at his supporting cast, and if you just go through every team, what if he had Mike Thomas or Alvin Kamara? Mm, mm -mm. What if he had, you give him the Ravens supporting cast. Mm. You give him Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, Dalvin Cook, Kyle Rudolph, Irvs, he wouldn't be the 11th best quarterback. Say it. He has Julian Edelman to help him and mm. nobody else, really. That's it. Everybody else supporting cast is much better than Brady's. Brady doesn't have that help. It, the Patriots as a team offensively are bad. Brady's going to take all the blame because that's just what it is. We give him, it's Mar what Marcella said is right. If that defense comes through, they're going to be okay. Last year, they won a Super Bowl, was it 13 to 13 10? 13 to 3. And so 13 to 3. So in spite of him. It's, in in spite mean? of him. Yeah, well, well, in spite of him. He didn't play. Like, in spite of his spite, supporting spite, cast, right. he was able to in get it done. Him, but he won. had Julian Edelman and Gronkowski. This year, is just Edelman. His supporting cast is so weak, it makes him look that bad. Stephon I, Gilmore goes out there and does what he did last year against Brandon Cooks in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And all those opportunities when he has shut down offenses this year, that's the same old Patriots. Look, I'm going to lean toward the 11th best team. I really firmly believe that. Okay. I don't know if I believe Kirk Cousins is better than Tom Brady, mm -hmm. but everybody else is. So he's t maybe the 10th best quarterback. <laughs> so Kirk Cousins is better than Josh Allen? Yeah, Kirk Cousins better than Josh Allen and and okay. uh you might as well throw and, Tom Brady in there yeah. too. I'm just like, saying, just Brady's number back. ten, to right? Me. You know, Kirk Cousins and Josh Allen are eleven okay, and twelve. Okay, Break them however you want. Woo. But the eleventh best team is the New England Patriots, and I couldn't remember, in that top four. Did you include the Saints in your top four? Because yes, San okay. Francisco, New Orleans, Baltimore, KC. Mm. That's five then. Yeah, yeah the, the Patriots, four the seeds best and. Team. No, the Saints are in the wild card round. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the top four seeds, mm -mm. no, you didn't include the No, no I, Green Bay is not better than Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, my bad. You agree my bad. with you I, with me? I, I, no. <laughs> I don't, but I hear, I hear your Green point. Bay. Green Bay is suspect. Thank they're you. better than, than the Patriots <laughs> this year. Ooh. Look, they're the 11th best team, and unfortunately, they're, play, they're not playing Buffalo. They're playing Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. That's what's good. Derrick Henry and these guys are going to break their back. And look. This game will be closed for a while. And then the frustration's going to set in. Those receivers are going to continue dropping balls. Mm. Tom Brady Tom Brady can see it. He's been talking about it all year. Mm. And he could, it's going that the inevitable is going to happen. 
Frustrations are going to set in. They're going to start to panic. The Patriots are going to do panic moves. It's just, I never thought I'd see the Patriots do what they did last year, last week at the end of the game. Where they the lateral. Uh, the laterals and all that. It was, it it was, was embarrassing. It was emb- embarrassing. I never thought I was. Patriots, they know. To try and win. <laughs> They're big plays in the second half of the season. It's trick, trick plays. plays. When did we see the gadgets? So they know it. offensively they don't have it. They know that supporting cast isn't there. No, but they you know, know no, it. it ain't. See, you keep talking about the supporting cast. The reason you're throwing halfback passes and double passes and all that is because your quarterback is not able no, no, to no. make it's those throws. It's because your receivers can't your get open. The quarterback can't make those throws. And look, the numbers. We talk about completion percentage since week nine, 56.9%, worse than Josh Lead the Allen. league in drops. Mm. Yards per attempt, <laughs> 5.9. That's worse than Duck. Doug Hodges, <laughs> passer rating 80.8, worse than Mitchell Trubisky. Mm. Passing touchdowns tied for 16th with Daniel Jones with 16. Now, at some point, numbers ain't lying. Okay. I'm not going to argue the numbers right now because I'm going to get into the attributes that we can't measure. Because, look, I have numbers that are better than those as well when you talk about their defense and their rankings. And this is one of the best defenses we've seen of this era by the numbers. But let's talk about the attributes. This is where I think we're really misinformed about the Patriots. People say that they're old. People say that it's a veteran team. But then they say, like Whitlock just said, that they're going to panic in, in, in trivial moments. This team that is old veteran, and just won the Super Bowl is going to panic versus a team that ain't been to the playoffs? And never been in this position where they are overmatched. Mm. Mm. They are physically overmatched without going. Look, man, it, it's like you used to pick fights when your best friends was the biggest dude, blah, blah. You go yeah. to the skating rink, and, yeah, I ain't afraid of nothing, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. blah. Let your friend be homesick. And then you real – the Patriots <laughs> – Rob Gronkowski yeah, is at home sick. Home I don't sick. like skating now. Yeah. <laughs> He's at home sick. What? They not – I'm just t- – they've never been in this spot. And, again, all hats off to Brady, Belichick, and all that they've accomplished. But it's over. They don't have the talent. It's a great ride. Look, and, and, and what they're going to tap into this weekend for a moment mm. is potentially, to me, an emotional edge because they know everybody's counting them out, and they've always had an emotional edge over most teams. Do you all agree with me that they have an emotional advantage going into this Tennessee game? Uh, yeah, go ahead. You ready? You I think so. up a bit. I think so. I think they have an emotional edge. I, th- I think they understand that, look, their path to victory is very small. They can only win a certain way. The defense has to carry the weight. The defense has to keep the opponent to under 17. If they do that, they have an opportunity to win. They know that their offense cannot score without the benefit of trick plays and things that happen in special teams. Their quarterback is not playing well. Yeah, emotionally, they have to play at a high level for them to get a win. Uh, Emotionally, they do have an advantage. When have we ever seen shots fired at the champs like this? And more importantly, they stick to the point where they have an internal narrative of us against the world when they're the champions. Like, and favorites this weekend. And favorites this weekend. <laughs> so I don't know why this is an occurrence, but I'm going to say that gives you an advantage because let's be real. If Tennessee loses in Foxborough, it's a nice soft mattress for them to say, hey, we just found our quarterback this season. We didn't even have him mm-hmm. in the beginning of the year. Hey, we, this is our first step towards playoffs and Super Bowl success because we weren't there last year. There are a lot of antidotes that you're going to provide for the Titans that you want for the Patriots, so that is an advantage for them. They have an advantage, and the biggest advantage, they've been down this road. You look at the Tennessee Titans offensively. Ryan Tannehill, they're skilled guys. Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown, Corey Davis, they've never played in a playoff game. Thank you. They've never... The New England Patriots, for them... They've been down this road. They traveled this road many a times, and so there's nothing that's going to happen. They're not going to be nervous waking up the day of the game. Oh, man, we got it. They've been down this road so many times that that advantage is going to come in. Now, if it's a tight game, you can see Tennessee tightening up. Mm-hmm. The Patriots, it's par for the course because we've been down this road. This is what we do. Patriots been tightening up all season in these close games, and it's, it's bitten them in the rear end in the second half of the season. Patriots will choke here under pressure. I'm going to tell you the other thing. Well, the, the, the Patriots defense, and it is on paper a great defense. But, and I love Stephon Gilmore. And, and, but hmm. the great defenses that can carry a team 
have a killer in the middle of their defense. They got mm. Singletary, they got Ray Lewis in the middle of their defense. Patriots don't have that. They got strength on the edges. You can run the ball you on them. You can gas them with Derrick Henry. Mm. You put a Ray Lewis, a Mike Singletary in the middle of this defense, somebody to control Derrick Henry, then you got it. But I think Derrick Henry's going to run. I think Tannehill's going to run. And I, th I think they're going to score – all they need is 17, hell. But, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. They're going to get 24, 27 points here. Look, if I'm the New England Patriots, I'm laughing at Jason Whitlock. If I'm the New England Patriots, <laughs> I remember last year we had a worse record. I remember last year we had a worse defense. You and didn't also, have a worse quarterback. You didn't have a worse quarterback. <laughs> oh, he turned into being one. <laughs> Two touchdowns, three interceptions, 85 QB rating. Mm. Marcellus, and, you see that clock? What's that? That it's, clock up there. The what does it say? Is there? Whitlock eat crow? <laughs> what, what does it say? Whitlock eats crow. Dynasty's ending. Oh, that man. <laughs> here's, 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 here's the nugget. Patriots, when they haven't faced a team in the regular season, see them in the playoffs. You know what the record is? Want to know what the record is? 17 and 1. One loss, and that was in the Super Bowl to the Philadelphia Eagles. If Belichick's seen you for the first time and it counts, oh, it's going to count against you. There's one, two. That's what two is the next number, and it's coming. <laughs> TJ Husmanzada and Bucky Brooks are back. Time now for a big story. Let's move to Dallas, where the Cowboys season is over. But for some reason, Jason Garrett's tenure as their head coach isn't. The NFL Network's Ian Rappaport says Jerry has already made the decision to move on from Garrett, but reportedly the two met again this afternoon, and there is expected to be no announcement about Garrett's status today. All right, uh, do we like how Jerry Jones is handling the Jason Garrett situation? I actually do. I, I, I respect it because um, if you look at it, nothing's being lost by showing some respect to Jason Garrett, and he's not losing out on any opportunities, any candidates, anything that he truly desires. Jerry Jones is not. So why not pay respects to somebody? What did the OGs used to say, the players used to say, hey, man, someone who's going to meet you is going to look at your ex to see how you're going to treat your next. So how are you treating this coach right now is really an announcement to everybody else who's looking at the Dallas situation, which is tricky because ownership and general management manager is the same guy. So you look at this situation, how is Jerry going to respect someone because the structure doesn't necessarily set itself up for a respect? And I like how he's taking his time with Jason Garrett. Jason Garrett has his agent, has his recruiters, already working like duck's feet. On the surface, it looks calm. Underneath, it is working. Jason Garrett's looking for the next opportunity. I respect this. No, I like this. I like taking your time. I understand that, look, his deal expires January 14th, so he has time. He's not going to fire him. It's just to be, hey, we're not going to re-sign you, whatever. I think what you want to do is you want to have – uh, opportunity to really talk to Jason Garrett about what went wrong with the season. You want to gather all the information that you have so when you go on to the next coach, you have a better understanding of exactly what you need to put the franchise in the right direction. So it makes sense to take your time before you part ways with Jason Garrett. Don't be emotional when you do it. Me, I love it. And I love it for, yeah, I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Jason Garrett is a human being. The oh. last 20 years. Oh. No, no, no. He's been a coach with the Cowboys for the last 13 years. Before that, he was a player for seven. Mm. So the last 20 years of his life, he's interacted with Jerry Jones pretty much on a daily basis. Mm. He's bringing a human up. They've built a friendship that goes beyond him being a coach. He knows he's getting fired. Jerry Jones is giving him the respect to kind of go out his own way. And for that, you got to respect that. True. I've been around the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm Jason Garrett, for 20 years. If I want to talk to my players and my staff, because what happens is Jason Garrett gets fired. He has a family, he has a wife and kids. Those assistant coaches, they have a wife and kids. But what players don't realize is, we talked about this before, the bottom of the roster. Y'all gonna be on another team next year now mm. because those special team, those core guys, all the new coach is gonna bring his guys in. And so for me, I like it. He's been there for the last 20 years as a Cowboy player and coach. And so, Jerry Jones, kudos to you. TJ, you've been married and with the same woman for a long time. You don't, you don't have a lot of experience getting dumped like I do. I've been, I've been dumped many times. There's no good way to be dumped. Just dump and move on. What? <laughs> you really believe that? Yes. Well, hold on. So text is the same as face-to-face. -face it's a little animosity when you Come dump on, and move on if you Come do on. it. Oh, it's oh, over. It's over. It's over. What about worse than text? Ignore. Just like, oh. Ghost. I've done that. Now, I've done that. Now, how do you think they felt? 
better than sitting around and <laughs> led around by a string for several days. But he knows he's fired. Weeks. You know he it's know, a wrap. He knows he's Y'all ain't touched each other. Announcing. Y'all ain't touched each other in two months. She knows it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> We're not coming in all bad. First of all, I want to know who's playing games with me because they've changed this clock. Now it says Patriots serve Crow. Where are they? Oh. <laughs> I'm uh, getting back to this next segment. They yes. better have the right clock back. <laughs> I, I hope you didn't have nothing to do with this. I mean, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. That's how I'm, I'm sitting that text Saturday night. I'm sitting that but text. Anyway, anyway no, I, I'm being serious. I, I, don't, I don't like this. You've missed out on Ron Rivera if he was a candidate for you. Now, look, maybe, because, again, I've said this previously. I think Jerry has a plan, knows who he wants to hire. Yes. And maybe all the things you're talking about, Bucky, is... He's doing a long exit interview so they can give the information to the new coach. Maybe Jerry can learn some things about... Maybe Jerry's trying to evaluate what it is he's done wrong from the head coach's perspective so Jerry can make some adjustments. But, uh, you know, again, he and Garrett have been together for 20 years, like TJ says. Whether you fired him Sunday night, Monday morning, you can still have all those discussions. Yeah, but you don't want to get the perception that this was a rash decision, that this was a harsh decision in terms of process. You want to actually project that you know what you're doing by actually taking that time and that patience. It's a professional way of doing it, especially when the structure suggests that the Cowboys upstairs has a lot of turmoil or chaos. So what do you do in this situation when you already know the inevitable? You slow play it. And I think that really is a great message for those other candidates to receive rather than Jerry just... You look at the Cleveland the Browns, how they're handling their right. situation, and you look at the Cowboys completely different. If I'm a head coach, there's no question I would prefer to go to the Cowboys just off the way things have been handled. The Cleveland Brown is going through coaches quickly, quickly, yeah. quickly. And he's taking his time, and everybody... It's been reported he's going to get he fired. He gave the man nine years to be the head coach, right? And that's why he knows he's going to get fired, but he's letting him go out right. his way. Why fire Freddie Kitchens when he still had not taken a shower after the game? They fired him Sunday. <laughs> you know, Lane Kiffin on the tarmac. Like, that, that suggests a, a yes. bad thing to yes. a lot of future candidates versus... Oh, you know what? They let you go out on a soft mattress. They respected you and, your, and everything that you did for the organization. I, 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 my mind is blown here. Really? And again, and maybe for, Jason Garrett <laughs> and his family were on the field after the game taking pictures. And so, yeah, it does They know like, it's over. They all seem to know. But I, I don't get this, this hanging around. To me, if I'm Jason Garrett, I'm moving on because I'm looking for my next head coaching opportunity. Allegedly, the Giants or somebody was going to be interested in him. I mean, all of this hanging on to me says he really doesn't have anything else lined up. And, and he's sitting around, you know, reminiscing <laughs> with Jerry Jones and Steven the, Jones. The recruiters do all that dirty work. There's a perception game that you got to play. Like, if this ended right now, you and I would like, I don't need them to come on camera and be like, hey, you got to go. I like, let me breathe. Let me go to the avocado room. Let me grab one more last water, get some drinks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, clean out my dressing room. Like, you ain't never, I've been fired. And they, they, police escorted me out, or security oh, escorted me oh, 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 what'd you do, Rick? Oh, oh, what'd you do? Oh, oh, just, I'm, oh I'm about to say, I got cut. <laughs> yeah. They let me live, yeah. <laughs> I never But that's the way most people get fired. They come to your cubicle, they have security with you, yeah. and they walk you out the door. Yeah, but you're not the face of that company. Like, he's one of the faces of this franchise. We have to save face. I think this exactly means what save face is, is intended to do. Save face. And I, I'm just... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll talk about Cleveland later in the show. But y'all, TJ, I disagree with you in terms of what's a better situation. Right now, Jerry's still going to be meddlesome with whoever the next coach is. That is the perception. Cleveland's out there cleaning house and going to empower some coach and general manager to run things in an effective way. This, to me, doesn't set Dallas up as, oh, they're a better job, blah, blah, blah. Jerry lets you hang around for nine years while he's on the sidelines halfway coaching the team mm. and having press conferences but, after every But I, I do believe that you can't speak to the stability of the Dallas Cowboys organization, the fact that Jason Garrett got nine years nine. to do his deal. 
nine years, at a time where people are cycling through coaches every two to three years, you can at least say, if I go to the Cowboys, I will have an opportunity to see my plan to the end. It didn't work out for Jason Garrett, but I think for the next coach, you take some solace in knowing, look, man, this guy got an opportunity to fully exhaust all the options when it came to building this team. It just didn't work out the way they want. All of this, to me, screams Urban Meyer's going to be the coach of the Cowboys. And they know it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think so, too. T.J. Husmanzada and Bucky Brooks are back. Let's move to the Ravens, who earned a well-deserved week off finishing the season with the NFL's best record and earning home field advantage for the first time ever. A lot of people think Baltimore is clearly the best team in the league, but I think they've got some competition over in the NFC. I've been saying for weeks that the Saints are the conference's best team, even though they're hosting the Vikings on Sunday on Wild Card Weekend. All right, am I crazy here? Are the Saints actually better than the Ravens? Crazy. Crazy, crazy. Uh, no, they're not. Um, if you look at the Baltimore Ravens, just on first glance, it's hard to poke a hole in the team. You're like, where are their issues? Uh, two losses came earlier in the season. Uh, the hottest team in NFL in terms of consecutive wins. And you just look at them in terms of rankings. Obviously, everything is going to skew towards Baltimore, especially what matters most. How many points you score? They're first. And how many you give up? Third. Woo, that's a lot. So I'm looking at how are the Saints going to be better than them? And then you start diving into details like when Baltimore had their murderer's role in terms of the schedule. They had seven games against five playoff teams. And they went, obviously, 7-0 against those teams with an average of a 15-point win against five playoff teams. So we're talking about Seahawks, 49ers, Texans, Patriots, and Bills. Not only did they beat them, they beat the brakes off them. So there's nothing in the Saints' schedule. There's nothing in the Saints' rankings that suggests that they're better than Baltimore. So I think that the Ravens are better. No, I mean, strictly watching the Baltimore Ravens play, you would like to think that they are a better team. They run the ball. They have a dominant running game. They mash it on everybody. Defensively, they're playing lights out. The Marcus Peters trade has allowed their defense to go to another level. And then you have the Lamar Jackson factor. No one has figured out how to slow down Lamar Jackson as a runner and as a playmaker. And so when I'm looking at a potential matchup of these two in Super Bowl 54, I just don't know how the Saints can come up with enough answers to knock off the Ravens. I don't even like agreeing with y'all again, but I'm with you. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's I'll not, fix it here in a minute, it's, PJ. It, I don't see how you can win. <laughs> right. What New Orleans does, Baltimore does better. <clears throat> New Orleans is a passing team, and Lamar Jackson has more touchdowns on the season than Drew Brees. Wow. And Mar- it took Marcellus to bring me to the point of mm. Lamar is, like, he was preaching it all year. And once I started, when you really mm. think about that, Drew Brees is a passing quarterback, and Lamar Jackson has more passing touchdowns than he has. Five mm. less and games. He, Drew Brees missed five games. That is true. but mm. Four less because Lamar The Ravens less. are yeah. better than the Saints in every category. They run the ball better. They pass the ball better, obviously, mm-hmm. from the stats. Yeah. Defensively, since Marcus Peters has come over, they're number one in the yeah. defensive points, one, number one in the NFL in total defensive points allowed. Same. And so for, for that point, there's no, no way because the Ravens can beat you in the air and on the ground. Listen, I, everything y'all have said about the Ravens is accurate. <clears throat> uh, I'll just say this about the Saints. Their stats are distorted because Breeze missed five games. And so I think that distorts their offensive and defensive stats mm. a bit. Teddy Bridgewater did a nice job, but he's not Drew Brees. Undefeated. The, the, the other thing that I think we're missing out on, the coaches preach all the time, turnover rate. Whoever wins the turnover battle, that's a huge advantage. The, the Saints are on a historic. They've made history. Eight turnovers all season. Mm. That's incredible. That's what mm. turns gives you a slight advantage or over compensates for whatever weakness you may have. The other thing I think, and, and I, over the course of the last two years, Sean Payton's the best coach in football. Mm-hmm. He's better than Bill Belichick. They should have been in the Super Bowl last year. Uh, and I think it, had they been, I think they would have beat the Patriots and we would be having a completely different conversation. And then when they turn around this year and use that motivation of what they feel was robbery and getting taken away, and they've been, to me, the most... <coughs> Lamar's been the most incredible player. The Saints have been the most incredible team because of this turnover deal, because of playing without Drew Brees, 
and never skipping a beat. The, the Saints have the turnover advantage. I think they have the motivation advantage. And I think they have a focus advantage. And I think, and it's a small one because John Harbaugh is a great coach. But they have a coaching advantage. And I think that gives them a chance to be in the conversation to be as good, if not better, than Baltimore. Yeah, but I'm also looking at what's the statement win for the Saints? Which one are you going to hang your hat on to say they're better than the Ravens, just staying narrowly focused to this yep. question? They had their moment. Went against San Francisco at home. Statement loss. And what had happened was <laughs> it became something <laughs> different. So it's hard for me to just look at a situation where then I see those same 49ers go, and when they played against the Ravens, oh, it, it didn't go so well. So I just don't see what I can hang my hat on for the Saints other than a lot of things that happened last year. I, I'm not sure if I got the number of games right, but it may be the last four or five games. I think Drew Brees' quarterback rating is like 137, mm -hmm. something yeah. like I'm that. Ridiculous. Makes Drew sense. Brees is – he and Michael Thomas, and again, that combination of Drew Brees and Michael Thomas, no one's been able to stop. I, I, and again, the, the Ravens would be a hell of a challenge, and I think some guys, they're going to see some double and triple teams on Michael Thomas in the postseason. But I, I just I just think the combination of Breeze, the way he's playing right now, the way Sean Payton's coaching, their motivation, and this turnover thing, if you win the turnover battle, I think it improves your chances of winning two, no, three, four times fold. No, that's a very significant stat because you're right about the turnovers. I, I think the numbers say that if you win the turnover battle by plus one, you win 65%, plus two it goes up to 78, plus three is you're in the 90. So yeah. you are on the right track. However, I think the way the Ravens play, they can neutralize – what the Saints do well. Because their running game acts as a defense, because they play keep away, <laughs> they don't give you as many possessions, and because they physically wear you down, I just think they are an outlier in terms of the way the rest of the league plays. They are a tough team. I would not want to match up with them. That's why I think their style gives them an advantage. Joined now by Fox NBA analyst Jim Jackson. Time now for Darnell's question of the day. All right, take it away, homeboy. Yes, sir, let's move to my Lakers. Oh, We're dealing God. with some drama this week. Ooh. It all started when Kyle Kuzma's trainer took a shot at LeBron on Instagram, writing, nobody wants to speak on how sharp Kawhi's skill set is compared to LeBron's. It's clear who's really in the lab and who isn't. Not long after, Kuzma appeared to respond, tweeting out, quote, call a spade a spade. Mm. <laughs> the tweet has since been deleted, and Kuzma said it wasn't in reference to, to his trainer's comments mm. and that he and LeBron have a good relationship. Not surprisingly, LeBron was asked about the situation. Check this out. Kuz came to me yesterday um, at practice and, 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 and told me what was going on. And, um, and, and that was it. Um, I really don't uh, really care for uh, someone's training or whatever the case may be. And what they, everyone can have their own opinion. Um, and anytime someone wants to get some notoriety, they can throw my name in and people are going to pick it up. And that's why you asked me about it. It's my name was in it. So, um, I've never met the guy. I don't know the guy. I don't care less about the guy. I want to ask you guys, is this something or nothing? Hmm. Uh, I think it's definitely something. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's something. I, I don't think the trainer speaks without having some insight. Mm. Now, I think mm. he also trained, did they say Kawhi Leonard maybe yeah. a little bit too? So maybe his insight comes from Kawhi. Mm. But when Kuzma tweets out, call a spade a spade. I think Kuzma feels like LeBron wants to trade him. And mm. I don't think he's all that happy uh, with LeBron, and that's where it came from. Yeah, I think it's something here. <laughs> I mean, one, this is a complicated story for something that should be so simple. So mm. let me give you two kernels my grandma used to say. Baby, you can't make sense out of nonsense. Mm -hmm. That's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And the truth is short and lies are long. <laughs> and, it's a long <laughs> and it's a long story, so somebody right. lying. Uh -huh. All right, let's break it down. Who knows the most about an athlete in the facility? The trainers. Why do when they ever go back into your background, they always go to the training staff? Because when you're sitting up there working out or getting taped up, you're just spilling beans. You're telling somebody how you really feel behind the veil. So now, let's talk about motive. Do we have a smoking gun? No, we don't, but we got motive. Kyle Kuzma came into this season upset that he wasn't part of the conversation of the Lakers having a big three. Oh, so every time you got to get that 10th rep, that 11th rep, come on, one more. Hey, they say you ain't part of no big three. It's a dynamic duo. Kuzma, like, yeah. And then what happens? <laughs> what happens on Christmas Day? 
Who had the most points for the Lakers? Mm. Kyle Kuzma. So he shot his shot, 25 points, led the team in defeat. So then that trainer, who's loaded up for all the months of training this dude to finally get into that conversation, shoots his shot. Bah! <laughs> and boy, Kuzma's like, throw away the gun! Throw away the gun! <laughs> And I uh, all I'm saying is, my, my <laughs> Matlock came out, and I think that Kuzma, you gave that man some ammo, bro. You know, he did. See, mm-hmm. it, take it a step further. It's not just the trainer, it's his personal trainer. Yeah. So that means they've had a lot of conversations. Now, mm. you can't control what somebody puts out there, but when you're in that inner circle, they have to know exactly how that affects you, Boom. the player. Boom. By putting that, remember back, it was a few years ago when Giselle came out and said some stuff about Tom Brady can't throw it and catch it either. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. You got to know that what's that going to do to that person once he gets back in the locker room? Yeah. He knew what was going on. Bang. And Kuzma, I guarantee you, they've had conversations. Now, no matter what Kuz does, I don't care. He can score 30 points. It's still going to be LeBron and AD. Mm. He know that. Mm. So is it something big? No. But it's an indicator on the thought process, I think, internally of what's going on on inner workings of the Lakers yeah. as far as it comes to a young player, yeah. okay? Yeah. He can't control what his trainer puts out there, but he can control the narrative and, like, look, bro, you can't put me in those situations. You got to know better unless he kind of wants that to get out there. Yeah. Don't you That's think, the, I mean, Jim, I keep hearing her talking about the Lakers are one more piece away and we still need another piece. That's the narrative I've been hearing all season it's despite true. their success. And so the only way to get that other piece is through Kuzma. Dre Kuzma. Because the piece, <laughs> they, Kuzma. Here, here, yeah, the, right. the, the piece they need is this. You're going to have to p- go through the Clippers. Yeah. Okay? Yep. You don't have a dynamic player when LeBron James is not on the court to be able to really create and do and go get his. Mm-hmm. Like you do with the, the Clippers have too many guys that can go do it. Yep. The Lakers don't. Mm-hmm. That's the piece that they're missing. Can they get a Drew Holiday in there to do that, which I think would be great? You know, they need that other piece. Now, the only asset they have, because they don't have draft picks, is Kuzma. That's it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you don't think he's hearing those rumblings? Yeah. But I believe he's hearing it. And he's been hearing it for a long for time. For a long time. And that, that's what makes this so weird and complicated, because he knows how his bread is buttered. One, he should be in New Orleans, all things considered, if he was going to be a part of the trade with all the other youngsters. But right. they saved him because they saw something special in him. But then the trainer knows that as well. He knows how his bread is buttered. One, through Kuzma, because I'm training you and getting paid by you. Two, if I upset the king, all of this can go away that fast. So I don't understand why even the trainer will be in the mindset that he think he's serving his client right. by shooting this shot. It makes no it's sense. It's emotion, though. It, and and yeah. social media... Mm baits you into going with what you feel in the moment. Mm. And just like you said, against, against, Jim just broke it down. Against the Clippers, they need blah, blah, blah. And so against the Clippers, Kyle tried to give it to him and did give it to him. Right. That third element, yes. blah, blah, blah. And the trainer's just feeling that hyped emotion like you did. Boop, hits the send button. Mm. Kyle's feeling it too, hits the send, send button. button. Mm. And now the fallout, which I think Kuzma feels like, it's a foregone conclusion. I'm out of here whether they like me, don't like me, no matter what I do. As soon as they can trade me, I'm out of here. I find the whole thing humorous because no one's caped up for LeBron more than Kuzma. Ooh, Here's the thing. Point, a- point. As a person, okay, you know when you're about to respond to a tweet or something, yeah. you know what you're about to do. Oh, yeah. And what ramifications can come from that. Oh, yeah. You know. So if he sees a tweet from his trainer, I can't go into his mind. You're right. But we know if you put what he said, call a spade a spade, People go interpret that a whole bunch of ways unless you put a definition of what you're trying to say. Mm-hmm. So now you put it out there real quick. Oh, my bad. Let me take it back. You know. Yeah, for one, you, you what? know what, what? you Will you take it back? Why you take, Why you take it, it back? back? I right. thought you didn't do it. Why anything. you take it back? We've all been in firestorms before, whether it's by our play, something in our mm-hmm. personal life, something we tweeted. Ain't no delete over here, bro. Nah, I bro. still stand by what I said unless I did something. It's, almost, it's like an offensive lineman. You ever see an offensive lineman throw his hands up mm-hmm. after he goes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the easiest way to draw the flag. Just throw the flag right throw now. The flag. <laughs> because you threw your hands up. Act like you didn't do anything. Exactly. Then you got a shot. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, joined again by Jim Jackson and Bucky Brooks. Time now for the most fearless discussion of the day. All right, like the rest of the mainstream sports media, the Associated Press isn't immune to the reality-distorting impact of social media. 
On social media, the NBA is 10 times more popular than the NFL. That's why so many media outlets and personalities make the mistake of treating NBA minutia like major news. NBA minutia is major news via Twitter's and Instagram's rigged algorithms. The NFL is major news in the real world, where interest in the topics is organic and authentic. Why am I bringing this up? Because five of the last seven years, the Associated Press's Male Athlete of the Year has been an NBA player. This year, Kawhi Leonard won the award over Lamar Jackson. Leonard joins LeBron James, who's won the award three times since 2013, and Steph Curry as recent winners of the award. Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers in 2011 is the last NFL star to win the award. Football is America's national pastime. It dwarfs the NBA in popularity by several miles. The NFL's regular season, in terms of relevance, intensity, and urgency, makes the NBA's regular season seem like a rec league. NFL quarterback is the most prestigious position in all of sports. Lamar Jackson is North America's 2019 Athlete of the Year. It's not close. The reason Leonard won the award is because of social media's distortion of reality. Lamar Jackson played the highest profile position in American sports, in America's highest profile sport, at arguably the highest level we've ever seen the position play. Jackson changed the way we view the position and the sport. He's the Tiger Woods of football. He led the league in touchdown passes and finished sixth in rushing yards. That's never going to happen again. I have no interest in denigrating Kawhi Leonard. He is an awesome basketball player. But his brand is load management. He led the Raptors to a title because injuries decimated the Warriors. Kawhi had a terrific playoff run. Lamar Jackson just put together a historic NFL season. A significant segment of the sports media root against the NFL and football. They've swallowed whole the distorted narrative that the game is deadly and leads to pervasive brain damage. They don't like the old school values taught in football. There's no point in trying to talk sense into the football haters. I'm trying to wake up the sports media folks who don't realize how social media is clouding their view of reality. Lamar Jackson is going to win the NFL's MVP award by a landslide. <sighs> Kawhi Leonard placed ninth in the NBA MVP voting last season. Mm. The ninth best basketball player is better than the best quarterback season we've ever seen? I don't think so. All right, Marcellus, get us rolling. Do you have an issue with Kawhi winning this award over Lamar? Me? Yeah. <laughs> you know I ain't got no damn issue. <laughs> I placed a vote for Kawhi. <laughs> By proxy. Um, uh -huh. Here's the thing. Uh, seriously, I think Kawhi should have won this award. And let's be respectful of both candidates and the winner, Kawhi and Lamar, who obviously came runner-up, but still amazing in terms of what he's done so far. But what has he done? He's the best quarterback in the game to this year by statistics. He's going to win the MVP. We respect all of that. Has he won it all? Well, you say the votes couldn't go in before he can win it all. So th this is a flaw in the calendar, a flaw, flaw in the voting schedule. But we've seen this before. Regular season MVPs and not winning the Super Bowl. Was the last quarterback to win a regular season MVP and win the Super Bowl? Got to go back 20 years. Kurt Warner. Mm. So there's a high probability he doesn't finish this deal. But let's talk about what Kawhi did. After getting maligned by the Spurs, sent out the country, goes to a team that can never get over the hump, gets him over the hump, wins the championship, takes his ball and goes home, and then goes to the lowliest franchise in NBA history and now makes them the favorite to win the championship all in one year. Come on, man. No one can write a story like that. It's beyond Hollywood, and he actually did it. And even if Lamar wins the championship, it still doesn't incorporate all of those details. We're talking about three different franchises and having different effects. So for my money, it's Kawhi, and that's why he's holding the trophy. Man, I was so ready to line up with you in the Kawhi thing, but your eloquent argument kind of made me mad. Like, you feel like you're just being disrespectful to the game of football <laughs> and what Lamar Jackson has been able to do. Mm. We talk about a revolutionary player, yes. a guy who is changing the game, not at only at this level, but at the lower levels, because he is going to inspire a bunch of little kids who may not have thought that they could play quarterback to play quarterback. And even though I get the Kawhi thing and I like the commercial, him coming back, the old school hoopty with the New Balance <laughs> shoes, all of that is nice. All right. Lamar Jackson 
is showing a whole generation of kids that look like him, they can play the position and be presidential as the quarterback position. I think his impact will transcend what Kawhi has done, even though that shot that he made mm. against Philly to eventually get them to the finals was nice. Mm. Well, let me split, mm. the, split the difference here. Let's do it. And I think his impact, Lamar Jack Jackson moving forward, will. But is it that he revolutionized the position, or is it that now – the masses have accepted that a black mm. quarterback can play this way. Because we said the same thing about Michael Vick. But at that time, the mindset of people wouldn't mm. allow us to accept True. that a black quarterback could do these things and be successful. Preach on. So, that revolution. Oh, 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 I what? just want to hold for one second, Jim. Mm. Don't reduce this to a black quarterback. No, no, no. No white quarterback has ever done what Lamar okay, Jackson this, this did. Is, this, Lamar this, Jackson just put together the most incredible season we've right. ever seen Steve from a Young quarterback. Plus. Regardless. Okay, so <laughs> revolutionize, okay, the time being, okay, we're passing the ball much more. LeBron James, I would say, revolutionized his position and what he's done in basketball. We've never seen anything like it before. Mm -hmm. At 6'8", 260, doing what he did. That's revolutionary sure. to me. I think... Right now, what Lamar has been able to do is take that skill set in today's game, the way it is with the passing, and really put an emphasis on what his athletic ability could do, but also what's underneath the helmet. Yep. So what Kawhi, I think he'll win it next year. If they can win the championship, no doubt he Bang. deserves it. Bang. But he has, to, to Marcellus's point, he hasn't he won it yet. Yeah. Right. So but I'm sorry, did the AP have a rule that you have to win the championship to win the award, or did you just have to be the best athlete in 2019? He's done all he can do in uh, 2019. I, I still agree with, okay, if you go back and look at some of the current ones in here, is he the best? I, I, I tend to go with somebody that won it from that perspective. Yeah. It's you almost know, like why did your movie come out during Oscar time? Because the calendar is a part of this. This exactly. is actually skewed where NBA is going to be favored over the NFL because you don't know what the NFL season has mm -hmm. culminated into. So he could go out there, Lamar Jackson, he could go out there and do what he did last year in the playoffs. I don't mm -hmm. expect that. But what if that happens? Then that affects what That's you're going to think about. That's going to think about what you're talking about next year. Next year. Here's the problem what I have with all this. Kawhi is not getting the proper respect for what he's done in terms of revolutionizing the game. LeBron came out, and a lot of athletes came out with the whole support of shut up and dribble and the support of, no, we're not that. We're more than mm -hmm. athletes, right? And shut up and dribble all of a sudden had this negative connotation. Y'all want to just sit there and play ball. And the Kawhi came through here, and you talking about revolutionize it. He made it positive. Just shut up, ball, mm -hmm. and that's it. You know what? Everything will come to you because if you take care of business, business will be handled. And that's what I think is the greatest effect. You're talking about youngsters. They're now going to be youngsters and say, I ain't got to get on social media. I ain't got to pop off. I ain't got to always just clout chase. I could just ball out and everything comes back to me. I respect you, that. You made a hell of a case and gave me a couple things I hadn't thought about. I, I just... When we think about 2019 and what we've seen, I'm to, when we go back 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people are going to be talking about what we've seen from Lamar Jackson because it's never going to happen again. You're not going to lead the league in passing touchdowns and be sixth in rushing yards. Yeah. It's incredible mm -hmm. what this kid has done. And, and again, he had his doubters. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. People that wanted Freak. him to switch positions. Freak. Me, Booger McFarlane, uh, Bill Polian, mm -hmm. uh, other credible people in the NFL. He shut them all up and has, and has done so. It's the best season we've ever seen from a quarterback. Is he the best quarterback ever? No, we're not going there. But we've never seen a season like this. And then to me, y'all are just jumping over. The Five of the last seven winners are NBA players? Well, you, you, you There's know a bias towards NBA players. Well, you know why? But to the detriment of the NFL, it's always preached it's a team game. It's mm. a team sport. Mm. It's always been for the NBA, once David Stern kind of took over, it was, it was really, you, you right. wanted to put the individual out because they needed to push it. And that's the thing. When Michael Phelps won, it was an individual um, accomplishment that he got. 
okay, in 2012. With football, because we look at it so much, you need the receivers to be on point. You need the offensive line to be on point. You need your running back to help support the passing game. So the quarterback, even though it's the glorified position, yep. it still can put, kind of put in that box of it's a team game. And I think that kind of devalues a little bit. But I think you're that. making my point, though. What's that? Mm. He broke out of the box. Right. But, but he's the guy. But like, people don't think about it. I mean, so the voters in, are not thinking about it that way. His individual talents mm-hmm. are so enormous right. that in the ultimate team sport, we've all had to sit back and go, Damn! Yeah, he <laughs> broke out the box, but did we break out the box? Because if you look at the Toronto Raptors, which was in around since 1995, how many championships mm. did they win? Mm. Uh, not only did Kawhi show up, say, we're going to get over this hump, we're going to do it together, and I'm going to benefit from it and take my benefits elsewhere to take the bottom franchise all the way you know to the top I wish in, they in, had, in expectations. If, the, if they had named co-athlete to mm-hmm. the year mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. given it to uh, Kawhi and Kevin Durant's uh, popped Achilles or whatever it was. Don't do that. Oh, really? Oh, come on. Giving it to Kawhi <laughs> and Kevin Durant's injured leg, I'd be right there with you. Oh, the, because that's, that's who won the championship for Toronto. Wow. I'm not denigrating Kawhi Leonard. The guy's tremendous. I hope I'm rooting for him to win the championship this year. Uh, mm-hmm. But damn it, everybody knows if Kevin Durant was healthy... It wasn't happening, and there's a reason why Kawhi was ninth in MVP voting. He's a low management guy. He wasn't the most dominant player in his own sports. He had a two-month playoff run. Hats off to him. But a two-month playoff run, based off of what we've seen from this kid for the last four months in football, at that position, in un- no one expected this. No one even thought what he this kid did was possible. My coach would say... Way to keep your eyes on the prize, Kawhi. Way to run the marathon the right way. Hey, at the starting line, that's where your mama is taking pictures. It looked cute to run out there and do all that stuff and not know manage. At the end, not too many people there to catch that, that picture you running across the tape. And that's what Kawhi did. Lamar Jackson could go out there. God, don't clip this clip right here because it's going to sound like I don't like Lamar. He could go out there and go eight for 20. And then I know y'all are going to say, well, that's for the next voting cycle. But for me, I'm taking it into account for this season. I think that people said, what in total has Lamar Jackson did versus what Kawhi did in total? Mm. I agree with you. The voting schedule needs to shift to allow the NFL experience mm-hmm. to be fully understood. But if he goes out there and does what he did last year in the playoffs, oh, come and, on, man, we ain't got an argument here. This is not a perfect example because – the Patriots went 16-0 and that season. Mm-hmm. But Tom Brady threw 50-some-odd touchdowns yep. in 2007 50, yep. and won AP Athlete of the Year. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible season. It wasn't as good as what I just saw from Lamar. It is true. And, and I think right, right, if there right, wasn't right, right. the bias against football, we wouldn't have this debate. Five of the last seven Athletes of the Year are NBA players. And I'm just sorry. If, if five of the last seven were football players, I would get it. Football is America's national mm-hmm. pastime. The NBA's traction in America, 26% ratings dip over the last two years. A regular season that just doesn't remotely compare to the NFL's. He, he's running a race that's not as hard as the race that Lamar Jackson has to run, and Lamar ran it better. But guess what? In 2007, when Tom Brady did that, the Spurs won the championship. You know damn well, ain't it? Nobody from the Spurs. Like, look at the competition. Like, you're not going to sit there and say, well, let's go grab uh, Tim Duggan for the AP Male Athlete of the Year in that situation. So but, but, but it's, a diff- it's a different balance, different competition. Who keeps saying – y'all keep going back to you got to win the championship to be AP Athlete of the Year. I, I don't believe that. I just think you need to be the most impressive athlete that I saw in 2019, and it's Lamar Jackson. You know who number two is? Hmm. Joe Burrow. That's who's number two is. Kawhi doesn't make my top two. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> well, but, but listen, no. Wait, wait, wait. I wasn't prepared for it. Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. Let me want to say this. Better but you win. Said, but you said it's not important, but yet and still, LeBron, Madison Baumgartner, when he won it, mm-hmm. they won the World Everybody Series. Won Steph it. won the championship. LeBron, Jose LeBron Antutu, last they, year they did. No, no, but LeBron yeah. didn't. That's, yeah. that's the one outlier right there, kind of. I just think that they should push it back. To allow football, yeah. because when you have something like that, he should be honored if he wins that. I mean, yeah. I think it just puts an asterisk on it that he got through that season. Again, 2007, internet, social media wasn't the same as that's it is now. Right. I know, and that's, not the same I, and, and that's to your point. 
from that perspective when Tom Brady won it. No, that's, that, that's really what it is. It's also, with the basketball thing, I think the way basketball has been pitched and mm -hmm. sold, it is more about the player. You see their face. It's, it's different. Um, I think with Lamar Jackson, and look, for a lot of us, we didn't know that Baltimore was going to be this team that kind of took the lead by storm, playing a style that was different than any that we had seen, but it worked. And I think the next time, unfortunately, he'll have to do it the first time to get their attention. The next time will be when he wins the award. Whitlock and Wiley, TJ Husmanzada is back. Let's move to Cleveland, where the Browns have decided to part ways with general manager John Dorsey. Just a couple of days after firing head coach Freddie Kitchens, Dorsey was the one who drafted Baker Mayfield with the first overall pick, and Kitchens was elevated to head coach due to his relationship with Baker who will now get a fresh start with a new front office and head coach. All right, guys. Is the Browns' house cleaning good or bad for Baker Mayfield? Oh, uh, it's a good thing that they're doing, and I don't think that Baker Mayfield would take full advantage of it. So I don't think it's going to work out well for Cleveland. Um, their, their, their heart's in the right place. Uh, their intentions are good. Uh, it's just Baker Mayfield right now, I don't think he's hit – that place in your career, his short career, where you realize how much help you really need and how much you have to rely on your infrastructure. So when he makes statements like, I don't need a quarterback personal coach. I don't need anyone to help me on my mechanics. I'll do it myself. <sighs> you had 16 weeks of football where yourself was involved and didn't fix those issues. I think an objective person or guru could actually help you when all the great quarterbacks have those same resources. They're on the 12th head coach and what, 10th general manager? Whew. So there's no stability there. I think it's, it, it sounds good, but I don't think it's going to land well. It, it's a great thing for Baker, and I'm with you. It's Is great it, for Baker. It's great for Baker. You look at the situation he was in this year, he regressed. If you keep it status quo, it's only going to get worse. Mm. He's going to continue with bad habits. I don't know what he's been taught, but when you continue to play the way he's playing, when a new coach would have come in in a year or two, he would have had so many bad habits that had to have been changed. It might, he might have been a lost cause. And so for Baker, they're doing this to see if they can get the first pick out of him because he's not playing like the first pick. This needed to be done. But if, I, if I'm a head coach, Haslam is on the team since 2012. This is going to be a six-head coach counting him giving Greg Williams the interim title. Why would you even want to go there? Every coach is getting two years. If you don't win in two years, mm. you're out of here. And you can say, oh, we're going to give you a four-year contract. Every coach has thought they were going to get more than two years. And they've been – Hugh had two years and six games. It's two years, Freddie Kitchens, one year that you don't get it done, you're out of here. I, I think it's bad for Baker because anytime you're not working for the boss who hired you, that's not generally a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's much easier for them to walk away and say that previous regime drafted this dude. He's got a bad attitude. He's undersized. Mistake at the number one pick. They can just wash their hands of Baker Mayfield. Now, I agree with Marcellus. There is an opportunity to turn it into a good thing for Baker. Is he smart enough, humble enough, self-aware enough? Because of what you it? just said, he better. And this regime, regime coming in didn't draft you. I, but here's the problem with Baker Mayfield. Yeah. Is you got to remember his narrative or his background is I went to Texas Tech. They didn't take full advantage of me. I left and went to Oklahoma. And so Baker Mayfield, all his narrative, all, man, you screwed up. I'm going someplace yep, else. Yep, it's on you. And mm -hmm. that's where I don't think he's going to take full advantage here of a new coach, a new general manager. I don't think he'll play it in a way – where he feels like he needs Cleveland, needs this success. He, he, he feels, <clears throat> I just need somebody to believe in me. And I, I, if I were Baker Mayfield, I would go look at the Lamar Jackson uh, blueprint. He bought in, Baltimore bought into him. There was equality in the passion for each other and putting the right amount of work in. Baker Mayfield needs some of that and he would have a chance, but I don't know if he's got it. Yeah, think about it. That mindset doesn't lend itself to someone who's going to figure this out on their own. And then the Cleveland Browns, their infrastructure doesn't give you the confidence that they're going to figure it out to help support Baker in that mindset. They're on the fourth head coach in three seasons with Baker Mayfield. What? That's, that's just no stability. Then you talk about him and his game, 
in the pocket. He's not accurate. He presses in tight windows. So all D coordinators said, well, let's get him off his spot as well. And then you have the accuracy issues outside. So it, there's a lot of Alex Smith, early Alex Smith, if people remember when he just kept having different coordinators, couldn't get the same situation. Number one overall pick. Uh, couldn't find exactly Much his great different game. person. So you you rooted for him. Right, and that's the problem. That's why I think it's going to be worse for Baker Mayfield. Like the ceiling early career may be an Alex Smith who was dealing with inner turmoil and constantly different playbooks and couldn't fully realize his potential. I think Baker And a better that. athlete. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for Jerry Jones. You know. You know. We have a special guest in studio, Marcellus Jr. You say what's up? Say Biscuit, hello. also in the house. Biscuit, All right. say hey. Who's the big dummy of the day? <laughs> you are, Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> big dummy of the day go to the person in the opening monologue. Couldn't resist it, Marcellus. What did he say? He said that the Patriots dine on disparity for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Doing another food reference. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help himself, huh? Can't help it. It's holidays. Let's yep. talk some Jerry Jones, who is expected to fire Jason Garrett at some point in the near future, with reports surfacing that Garrett was already saying goodbye to Cowboys staff members. Obviously, Garrett's tenure was disappointing. Marcellus, do you trust Jerry Jones to get it right with his next coach. Uh, I trust you, Jerry, if you go back to how it all started and how it all became successful, the college ranks. I know it doesn't work for most places, but it has worked for you. Obviously, we know what Jimmy Johnson did and even Barry Switzer. Urban Meyer is in the building, baby. We can get to him quick, too. Mm. Urban Meyer is time to become the Dallas head coach. All right, I'm very concerned with Marcellus Jr. here, and I'm about to throw to Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> we have no idea what he's going to say, but Uncle Jimmy, do you have any thoughts uh -oh. on uh, Jerry Jones? Cover your ears a little bit. First of all, whatever I say, <laughs> I'm going to keep it real with what I'm going to say, all right? Yeah. All right, and let me just say this on the first. I ain't got no problem with how Jerry Jones handling this. Really? You know, like Jerry Jones said, Jerry Jones told you. He said, the Dallas Cowboys, he said, we're a family. <laughs> so that makes Jerry and Jason Garrett the parents of the Dallas Cowboys. Mm. All right. All See, right. Jerry the breadwinner, <laughs> and it's Jason Garrett's job to run the home. Mm. Yeah. And for some reason, he falling down on his duties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Jason know it. Mm. And so right now, they got to have that conversation. <laughs> you know, and it's not a very pleasant conversation. Mm. You know, right now, Jason looking across the table and uh, cover up your son's ears, he said, give me one good reason why I should keep your sorry ass around. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> you don't cook? <laughs> you don't clean? <laughs> Got my little kids running all over town acting crazy? Oh, man. And you know what? Let's be honest, y'all. Hey, Jerry, right. Look at, look at the Cowboys at the beginning of the season. Look, look, look. Zach, Ezekiel went to that rebellious stage. Mm. Ran off down to Cabo. Mm. <laughs> you know, got nose piercings, back tats. <laughs> now I don't know what kind of trouble the boy got into. Yep, yep. But Jerry said it cost him 50 million to get the boy back home. <laughs> okay, now you got that. Okay, now that's the prodigal son. He's supposed to be the smart one. Yeah. The scholar. <laughs> but now you know his grades is up for the public to see. <laughs> the boy eight and eight. <laughs> That's a C average in any country. <laughs> you know, and it's not because he don't try. Right. God bless his soul. The boy worked diligently. Mm. You know, he ain't out there in the streets with Ezekiel. <laughs> you know, but let's just put it like this. Yeah. Dak ain't the sharpest bowling ball in the shed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The boy can build a toaster, but he just can't cook toast out of it. <laughs> okay, now, now we get into the subject. Uh, now you got Amari. Yeah. Okay, now that's a touchy subject for Jerry. Okay, because Jerry used to, used to people around like Michael Irvin, Des Bryant, you know, big tough guys, outspoken. Amari don't look like him, he don't act like him, he don't talk like him. And I'm going to tell y'all something, behind the scenes, Jerry don't even think that's his kid. Oh, man, we going here. Look, Jerry! You need to find somebody to get your kids in line. <laughs> <laughs> Nephew, what you say? A man's only as good as his options. Yeah. yeah right now, Jerry got options. He got Urban Meyer, Lincoln Riley, Josh Daniels. What he should do, he need to go get more Eric the Enemy, get David Shaw, 
Hell, go get Tony Dungy. <laughs> Jerry, you know what they say about the Super Bowl. Mm. If you want to go back, you better go black. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them what I said, Douglas. <laughs> All right, I got Jerry down to a If you want to go back. It's 67. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Oh, I got man. Marcellus hey, has him at an all-star. Star. I got him at 70. Role player yeah. save. Oh, I got him all-star. Barely yeah. all-star, but it's internet. The internet day. has internet him day. at a dumpster fire, 65. Say bye. Say, Say bye, bye, bye Marcel. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy Lock New Year. In.